Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis and Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine. Today we're on Topic 9, Lesson 2. And we're going to be talking about advanced statistics for nominal data. And before we start, I want to explain a little bit what this lesson is about. I'm not going to provide you much detail about these advanced methods. My real purpose in this lesson is just to describe some of these advanced methods so that if you see them in the literature, you'll know sort of what they relate to, but more importantly, so that you will have heard about them. And in your own research going forward, you might have a problem and say, you know, I remember Professor Peregrine said something about a statistic I could use to, to find that out. That's really what I'm trying to do. So try and get out of this lesson not any detail, but just the knowledge that there are a set of techniques that allow you to do more advanced things than we've looked at chi-squared and lambda, that you can do additional things with nominal data, and that there may be cases in the literature where you read about them, and there may very well be cases in your own research where you might want to use these. And that, that's why I'm talking about them here today. So we're going to begin with something we actually have already mentioned, which is Fisher's exact test. And this is R.A. Fisher, who was the inventor of ANOVA. Um, this is a test that you use in addition to chi-squared, or as another tool in the chi-squared toolbox that allows you to to do a chi-squared kind of analysis, but where there are expected frequencies less than five. And remember that one of the requirements for doing chi-squared is that the expected frequencies have to be greater than one and should be less than five. Fisher's exact test lets you do an analysis when the expected frequencies are less than five. But it really works on two by two tables only. It doesn't really, it works on two by two tables only. So it is limited in that way. I'll tell you that another way to deal with this is in collapsing categories. If you have expected frequencies less than five in a chi-square, you can collapse categories, maybe down to a binary variable, a two by two table, and you'll increase the expected frequencies that way. So. Um, if you have a 3x3, three 4x4 three, four four table and you've got some expected frequencies less than 5, collapse it to a 2x2, two two, you may end up with expected frequencies greater than 5, and then Fisher's exact test is not necessary. But if you still have expected frequencies greater than uh, or less than 5, you can, you can use Fisher's exact test to deal with that particular case. Okay. Another thing that we actually have heard about before in correlation is called the phi coefficient or phi coefficient. I said this back then. I've always heard it referred to as the phi coefficient, but it may just be that my teachers didn't know how to pronounce it because it's spelled phi. So I'm going to call it the phi coefficient. You may elsewhere hear it, the phi coefficient. I think probably, well, that one might actually be correct, but I'm going to call it <coughs> phi coefficient. The phi coefficient is a measure of association for two by two tables. Um, what that means is that lambda allows you to do a measure of association for larger tables, but it has some limitations. It goes from zero to one, so it's not necessarily that easily interpreted. Phi coefficient goes from minus one to one and can be understood just like a correlation coefficient, but for a two by two table. So if you're doing, if you want to look at a correlation, want to see if it's negative or positive, and you have dichotomous variables, nominal variables in a two by two table, um, you can use the phi coefficient. Gamma is a really useful statistic that I think is really underused in research. It's not in many of the textbooks, and so I think that's part of why it is. But gamma is sort of a general purpose measure of association. It works with ordinal variables, and it also works by, with two by two tables of nominal variables. And when it's used that way, it's sometimes called Ewell's Q, because Ewell's Q is a special case of gamma, was developed first. Um, 
So you may see this in the literature, especially older literature, uh, Ewell's Q. It's a form of the gamma coefficient. And this also varies from minus 1 to 1. And so it allows you to directly interpret like a correlation coefficient. So it's like phi in the, in the case of it's a correlation coefficient that varies from minus 1 to 1 that you can use on a 2 by 2 table. But it also can be used with ordinal variables. Um, and so that's, that can make it really useful. It's, a, it's one of those tools, again, I'm not quite sure why it isn't discussed that much, but it, it may be something you want to look into at some point, especially if you have a mix of nominal and ordinal variables and you want to maintain the same statistic, that might be a nice thing to use. Uh, one of the other things about gamma is that it does allow you to calculate a p-value, a probability value which the others don't. So you can get a likelihood. Uh, uh, this is a very unlikely relationship to have found, or it's a very likely one to have found. So that's very helpful. OK. There are some ways of doing regression with nominal variables. These come out of a, a, a format that's, or that's called the general linear model. What we did when we talked about regression is talk about least squares regression. And if you remember, we talked about creating a regression line that was in a location where there was the least squared variance or least squared difference from that line to all of the other points. That's least squared regression. The general linear model uses a different set of assumptions and techniques to determine uh, the, the fit of a model to a set of data. That's really what that line is. It's the best linear fit to two variables or multiple variables. The generalized linear model doesn't expect a linear fit. It expects a fit of different kinds. Um, and so one of them is using uh, logs, a logistic kind of regression called logit, you'll see it in the literature, that works only for binary variables. But it allows you, and, and they have to be binary cat categories, yes, no, male, female, up, down, right, left, this kind of binary opposition categories. But uh, logit allows you to use those to do a regression, in other words, to fit a model and get a, a sense of how well you can predict one variable based on the other. The other one is called probability unit regression, or probit. This requires a binary dependent variable. And then you can use nominal or, uh, uh, sorry, interval or ordinal data for the other variable or variables in the model. And again, what you're doing here is you're fitting a model. In other words, you have a hypothesized way that two variables interact with one another or are associated with one another. What Logit and Probit allow you to do is to determine the extent to which that model actually fits the data. So it's a little different from linear regression where you're sort of letting the computer decide what the model is. Here you have a a model that you're fitting to the data to see if they fit. So in some ways, it's kind of like the difference between a chi-squared test of independence and a chi-squared goodness of fit test, where you're starting with a model and seeing if the data fit versus starting with the data and, and, and fitting, letting the computer fit a least squares regression line to those data. But it is great that you can do some form of regression or prediction with nominal data, albeit limited, binary, or with one binary variable. Uh, by the way, you can do least squares regression with a binary variable, but probit is much more appropriate in most cases, and it is required if you have a binary and an ordinal variable. Again, 
you don't need to know these. I just want you to have heard these so that you can, if you read them, you say, oh, I've heard of that. Or if you're doing research and you say, boy, I really wish we could do a regression and test this model, but all we have is nominal data. Wait, Logit, we can use that. Okay. And finally, a really neat technique that I've made use of a lot and again, this is underused because I, th I think it's just not explained that often. It certainly is not in the textbooks very much. And it, it has a logic to it that's a little bit complicated, but it's called log linear modeling. And what it does is allow you to, to analyze more than one set, uh, or more than two nominal variables. In other words, more than one cross tabulation. Um, that can be really powerful because you may have a, a model of relationships or a hypothesis that, re, that uh, has multiple variables in that model uh, and log linear modeling allows you to test those models to see which one fits the data best with nominal variables. So the way that this works is that you have a predefined model based on a hypothesis of how three, four, five nominal variables work together. And then in log linear analysis, you, you do a series of iterative tests that determine which of the, the, all of the potential models that could be present with those variables. So if we have three variables, there would be nine potential models. It, X interacts with Y, Y interacts with Z, X interacts with Z. X interacts with Y and Z, X interacts with Z and Y, right? So you can have, you would have nine different models to test and, and it will help you determine which one best fits the data and you'd hope it's the one that you assume fits the hypothesis. So log linear modeling, again, you'll see in some of the literature, but more importantly, as you're doing your own research, if you're in a project and you say, eh, we got three nominal variables and we think they interact, I wish we could test that. Well, you can. All right, that's all for today. And again, all I'm trying to do in this very brief lesson is introduce a set of more advanced statistics that you don't typically see in textbooks, but they're for nominal data and for us as anthropologists, nominal data are very important. We use it a lot, we see it a lot. So knowing the, the tools that are in the toolbox that go beyond a sort of standard course or standard textbook are important because you may read about them, you may want to use them, and now you at least have heard the names. So we'll see you next time.